Thanks for joining me. My name is Adam Derwicki, and today I'm going to walk you through the first chapter of my book, Building a Website on Heroku, Learn Ruby on Rails Tutorial, available on LeanPub. The book starts by going through prerequisites for different command line tools that we're going to need. I already have them set up, so I'm just going to verify them by printing out their version numbers. So Ruby, we're on 2.0. Rails were on 4.02, bundle above 1.3, git 1. Point, I mean any version of git's going to be fine. I wouldn't worry about that. And the last command line tool, Heroku, is also installed. Great. So we're going to start by Rails new my site name. This tells Rails that we want to create a new project with all the standard bells and whistles. Uh, and it does that with a standard gem file, which it then goes through and installs using bundle install. So the very first thing I'm going to do is initialize a new Git repository, add everything to it, and check it into the code base. Now we can see any changes that we've made apart from the standard Rails install. Basically all the work that we're going to be doing will be a diff from this starting point. So the first thing I mention in the chapter is that we need to make some gem file changes before we can run this project on Heroku. So I'm going to open the gem file op up for editing in Vim, my editor of choice. And uh, as the book mentioned, uh, SQLite 3 is the problem here. SQLite is a very lightweight database that's often used for local development in Rails applications and is the default. Um, but more professional websites, professional is probably not the right word, but websites with any real amount of traffic or users uh, need a more robust database. And Heroku provides Postgres, which is a very popular database. Uh, so the problem with this gem specifically is that it requires uh, some code that's not just Ruby code, what we call a native extension, and it fails to compile on Heroku. But that's fine, we don't need it to compile on Heroku because we're not using SQLite on Heroku. So I'm just going to change this gem to be guarded by a group. And this will tell Rails that this gem is only to be used if the environment is development. And if we are in production, then we use the Postgres gem. So I'm just going to save and quit. And after modifying a gem file, you're going to need to run bundle again to update gemfile.lock. So if we look at git status, we'll see both files have changed. The changes that we made in gem file, and then the generated changes that lock Postgres to a specific version. Cool. Now. The project that we've created basically has nothing in it. If you run a local development server, you'll see a, a welcome to Rails thing, but that's not even going to work on production because it's just a, a static file. So we're going to use what's called a Rails generator to create a scaffold. So a few new words. Let's look at the help for generate. Generate has a bunch of different engines to create sort of the standard Rails um, files. So if you needed to create a new controller for a home page, you can create a controller. Or if you needed to create a new migration that added, I don't know, a new field to the user model, you could use Rails generate migration. Uh, because we have a brand new project and don't have anything, I'm going to generate a scaffold which will create a model, a controller, a view, all the views actually, all the restful views, and the routes. And I'm just going to call it page. And we'll see that it creates a host of files, um, the ones I just mentioned, the model, controller, views, and then style sheets and JavaScript files and things like that. So now we have a page. Let's open it up. App views, because the controller is pages, it will be in a pages directory, and we want index. So the very first thing we see is an H1 heading with the very boring phrase, listing pages. So we're going to change that to, hi mom, I made a website for you. 
because it's slightly more interesting. Now, if we look at the git status, we'll see that we've created a bunch of files, but they're what's called untracked. So if I just create a file, then it will also show up as an untracked file. Anything, any file that exists in these directories that Git doesn't know about, it will treat as an untracked file. And you'll need to explicitly add it into Git. So we're going to add app and db folders because we want everything in them. And now the only things that are left, let's see, git add gem file. And we'll see that what's left is a diff in config routes. So just to take a quick peek at that, the diff is that it's added a resource for pages. And that just means all the a resource uh, encapsulates standard routes. So in this example, slash pages will exist, slash pages slash new, slash pages slash page number slash edit, um, all the sort of default things. But we also want to tell Rails that if you just go to the root path, just my site name dot heroku app dot com that it should go to the pages index controller so we're going to very simply use the root directive and just point it at pages controller index and then we can add config routes and we'll just look at the git status so all the things that we are about to commit the gem file changes that corrected the SQLite Postgres mismatch, the output of the Rails generate command, and then also the additional changes that we've made to configs routes.rb and app view pages index.html.erb. We're not going to worry about the test files right now because eventually we're going to switch to RSpec instead of test unit, so we'll end up throwing these away. Just a brief note to say what we did. And now we can run migrations locally. When we set up the scaffold for the page, it created a table, even though we didn't put anything in it. Um, so we just need to make sure we run the migrations. And the DB schema was created after the first migration is run that just says we have a table called pages and we don't have anything interesting in it because we didn't put anything interesting in it. But by default, Rails will add created at and update timestamp fields to uh, each new table. So we need to add DB schema. And we should be able to launch a local web server and test it out. So that means our web server is running. I'm just going to curl it instead of pulling up a web browser. Cool, page was served, h1 is hi mom, I made a site for you. Great, control C will kill out of this web server. And now we want to create the app on Heroku. So the name was available, my site name, and as it says, it added a git remote called Heroku. So we can just git push Heroku master. Now, as soon as the code is received on the Heroku end, you would think that it's time for to visit the website and it'll all work. But because it hasn't run any migrations, the Rails app thinks there should be a pages table, but there isn't one. So Rails will complain loudly about that. So as soon as this deployment is done, we need to run the equivalent uh, rake db migrate command on the uh, remote Heroku system. And then we'll have to restart the app so it can scan and find the table.
the speed of this can vary. Uh, it usually takes one to two minutes for a, a brand new project as your project gets larger and especially as you add more um, static assets like style sheets and images and JavaScript files. Um, this process uh, can take much longer. Okay, Roku run rake db migrate. And it's created the pages table. Dinos have restarted. And now we should be able to curl my site name dot heroku app dot com. Hi mom, I made a website for you. Okay, that takes us to the end of chapter one. Thanks for listening and be sure to check out the rest of the book on leanpub.com slash building a website on Heroku. Thanks for listening.